and uh, then we'll begin. Father, thank you uh, for your word, and as we uh, start a new book this morning, I pray that you would um, give us wisdom and knowledge and insight and uh, humility and everything that we need to allow your word and your spirit to um, transform us, to empower us, to change us, to renew us, to uh, encourage us, to strengthen us, to help us live lives that please you. Yeah. And uh, I pray that the words that I speak will be anointed uh, by you so that they can transform us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, so we're going to look at the book of Ecclesiastes over the next few weeks. Um, I think Grace once told me it was her favorite book because it just goes on about how meaningless life is. But um, it takes a bit of unpacking because it's different to any other uh, book uh, in the Bible. And it is challenging. It can be depressing if you read it um, in the wrong way. Uh, but what I like about it is that it brings us back to reality, the reality of life uh, and what is important and how to view life. Um, for those of you who don't know about the Bible much, uh, there's the book of Proverbs, which is full of wisdom. That was the book that I was uh, encouraged to read by my parents uh, when I was younger, uh, full of good wisdom in there. Um, good principles, and I'd encourage you if you've got children or just generally if you want to wise up and seek God's wisdom for life, uh, Proverbs is a really good um, book to read. However, what we shouldn't do with Proverbs is uh, take it as promises, okay? Shouldn't be promises. So, for example, if we can go to Proverbs 28, verse 18. Okay, this is a proverb. What it means that generally this is how life goes. It says, he whose walk is blameless is kept safe, but he whose ways are perverse will suddenly fall. And, um, yeah. Does it mean, you know, he whose walk is blameless is kept safe. We know that's generally good. You know, when, when you obey God, um, when you do his will, there's a divine protection. He sends his angels to protect you. Okay? However, that's not always the case, is it? As, as Stephen, the, uh, the, um, you know, the apostle Stephen, who, uh, who was martyred, you know, he whose walk is blameless is kept safe. When you're being stoned and you're dead, you might think, hmm, I was blameless, but I've been martyred. Um, even Jesus, <laughs> he was definitely blameless. Um, and was crucified. Um, but generally speaking, if you do what is right, God will look after you. We know Job in the Old Testament, blameless, you know, righteous man. But sometimes there are things don't always go exactly how, they, how, um, how it says in the Bible. And so you've got to think, all right, okay, that questions things, doesn't it? It questions God. It's like, okay, um, if I do this, then, you know, you become a Christian, you start obeying God, and suddenly you're poorer, or suddenly you're, lo you're lonely, <laughs> or, um, yeah, and sometimes we see people who are unrighteous prosper and seem to do well, and, you know, seem to be uh, as safe as houses, so to speak. Um, what else does it say? Um, a lazy person, it says... Poverty comes to lazy people in Proverbs. But we all know the lazy person who wins the lottery, right? Sometimes life doesn't work like that. Um, we also know the person who works day and night and still struggles to make ends meet. So they're not guarantees of how life will go, but they are a very wise thing to follow. Um, they are God's wisdom. But life isn't as black and white as we always like it to be. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of um, questions that we have to ask God sometimes. You know, 
even people who aren't Christians, they often think, well, you know, they ask the question, if God is real, if God loves us, then why is there all this stuff in the world that doesn't make sense? And, and as Christians, we should be humble enough to realize that we don't know everything, that we don't have all the answers, that sometimes we've just got to look to God and trust in him. And as before we read Ecclesiastes, because I think if you read it uh, without knowing um, the ultimate kind of conclusion that it comes to, you can get really a little bit confused. Uh, you can get quite depressed. Um, so it's written in the first person in most of it. So, you know, it's the teacher who talks to us as if you're just having a conversation. Not really, There aren't really any other books in the Bible like that. Um, but Ecclesiastes is. But it doesn't start off with the person, the teacher. It starts off with the author of the book. And so if you can go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. So here's the introduction. It says, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Most people think it's Solomon. There is, it's not 100% sure that it's Solomon. Some people think it can't be Solomon. Um, and then it's some other king in the line of David. Um, but yeah, it could be Solomon. And I think my Bible here assumes it's Solomon. So um, we'll go with someone like Solomon. Uh, it says, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. What do people get? Oh, if we can put it on NLT. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north. Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea is never full. Then the water returns again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. History merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here is something new, but actually it is old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past, and in future generations, no one will remember what we are doing now. And then uh, the teacher starts to speak. But what I just want to do before we start reading all of this, uh, because there's a I've kind of broken the book up into sections. So um, in, let me just find it. So chapter one and two, we're looking at kind of um, the futility of wisdom um, and trying to pursue knowledge and wisdom. You know, trying to become as educated and, and as wise as you possibly can. And we realize that actually, um, without God, it's empty uh, and, yeah, means nothing, meaningless. Equally, some people pursue um, pleasure, you know, good pleasure, pleasure that's bad, maybe even illegal. People uh, pursue that sort of thing and realize that it's empty and without meaning. Some people pursue uh, work to find meaning, to find satisfaction, to find life. And at the end of it, they realize that everything they've worked for will just be left to someone else. What was the point of all that? Um, so it can be uh, quite depressing. Uh, then it talks about how there's a time for everything in life, and we'll look at that. Um, we'll then look at, let me just find it. So I'm on paper notes today. But yeah, time belongs to God. Um, then we'll look at um, how we approach God. You know, because uh, Ecclesiastes talks about the practical ways to actually approach God and not come, come to God with foolishness, um, the way to approach wealth and money, um, the way to, let me find it, um, enjoy life, to um, 
rest in God and find contentment in God. Um, wisdom, there's some more wisdom. A bit, there's a bit of like Proverbsy type stuff inside Ecclesiastes in chapter 7. Um, chapter 9, or chapter 8, is kind of being obedient to God, being obedient to the king, um, and how sometimes the wicked prosper and sometimes the righteous suffer, and sometimes it's the other way around, but ultimately the wicked wealth will be given to the righteous. Uh, chapter 9 is all about death and how it includes us all. You know, people talk about being inclusive these days, don't they? Death includes everyone. No one gets missed out there. Um, and so it's important to uh, have the right understanding and right approach to death because some people um, brush it off. Some people are terrified by it. But as Christians, as people who know and trust and fear God, uh, we can have the right approach to death and actually it can really help us how we live and how the decisions we make. Um, chapter 10 and 11 are about kind of life being uncertain, that it's full of risks, um, that you can be fearful or you can put your faith in God. Uh, chapter 12 is kind of specifically talking to young people, which we all are here, uh, and how uh, it's so important to remember and honor God when we are young, when we have the opportunity to. Don't wait till it's too late, when we're too old to, you know, even look after ourselves. Actually, it's better to remember. And this is the thing that the a verse that I was given when I left St. James's secondary school. Uh, it was written in the card by my head of year, and it was about remembering your creator in the days of your youth before trouble comes. You know, when you're young and free and the world is your oyster and you have no responsibilities or cares, that is the best time to remember God. Um, and so we'll look at that. And also chapter 12 concludes with the kind of summary and the conclusion of Ecclesiastes. So I just want to read the concluding thoughts. I know it seems a bit backwards, but if we can go to chapter 12, verse 8, this is what uh, the author says about what the teacher has said. Again, everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Keep this in mind. The teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to expre express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives the sheep. We're the sheep, by the way. <laughs> uh, but my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And that's it. That's, that's the conclusion to Ecclesiastes. And so I think my point is that actually, what should we do? Fear God and obey his commands. And so whenever, when we're reading through Ecclesiastes together and looking at it, keep that in mind, that actually the most important thing is to fear God and keep his commands and... Bear in mind, whatever we do, because Ecclesiastes says to enjoy life, to live it. Um, it says God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. And so whatever we do with our lives, however we choose to live our lives, it's really important that we fear God, because that will, I mean, you know, Proverbs says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And it's not earthly wisdom, it's godly wisdom, heavenly wisdom. Um, and so it's important that we study Ecclesiastes through that lens that actually we can go through life and a lot of life is kind of empty, but actually uh, God calls us to enjoy life, um, but in the fear of God, you know, in the fear of God. You can try and enjoy life without the fear of God, and it might be nice for a while, but it will all come tumbling back down. So, let's uh, look at chapter 1. 
it says, uh, so we've read the first bit, the first verse, so we're up to verse 12. So this is the teacher speaking. It says, I, I, the teacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. And that's what the, um, the word means. Um, so meaningless is kind of the translation here that we've come to in our Bibles. The original Hebrew word is hevel, which, if you're, which basically describes a vapor or a smoke. You know, if you see someone, I don't know, smoking, try and grab their smoke, open your hand, there's nothing there. And that's what he's describing life is like when we try and, you know, life is real, we see it, but when we try and grab hold of it, when we try and, um, what's the word that means uh, grasp? When we grasp something really tightly and then we open it and it's not there. And that's life. You know, life is fleeting. If you go to Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter, chapter 39, verse 5, Psalm 39, verse 5, we'll read many times in the Psalms, um, does the psalmist describe life? You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. And then if you go to uh, Psalm 62, verse 9, For Jeduthun, the choir director, a psalm of... Sorry. <laughs> Common people are as worthless as a puff of wind, and the powerful are not what they appear to be. If you weigh them on the scales, together they are lighter than a breath of air. And then 144, verse 4. What does it say? For they are like breath of air, their days are like a passing shadow. And if we just go to James chapter 4, 14... How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. So Ecclesiastes doesn't pull any punches. It tells you that life is short. And I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone here that life is short. It really is. And so it's important to, uh, to live it right. Um, and not try and kind of build our life on a breath. You know, we need to live for something greater, and that's eternity. Yeah, so it says it's like chasing the wind. I don't know if you've ever, if, I've never tried chasing the wind, but I can imagine that it's kind of futile and you never actually catch up with it. Um, verse 15, what is wrong? Sorry, chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes. What is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. I said to myself, look, I am wiser than any of the kings who ruled in Jerusalem before me. I have greater wisdom and knowledge than any of them. So I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly. But I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. The greater my wisdom, the greater my grief. To increase knowledge, only increases sorrow. <laughs> um, you know, those of you that are parents have, you know, may have said, oh, you know, we don't want our children to grow up too soon. You know, because once you start learning more and more about the world, it can really be quite depressing, can't it? You know, that, it, you know, just watching the news, a child watching the news, it's just like, I mean, you know, we try not to show them the whole of the news because really it can be horrific sometimes, can't it? Because um, you don't want to burden them with things before they're ready. And um, unfortunately, that's the way things is. As you get wiser, um, often, I guess, if you're a wise person, people might come to you with their problems. And that can be um, bring you quite a bit of grief because then you discover that people have problems and, and that um, can discourage you or depress you if you're not relying on God. Um, equally, if you're wise... You know, you look around and see people making foolish decisions, and you just, it just, you know, brings grief, doesn't it, to your heart? You just go, oh, why? 
why are, they, why are they doing that? Why are they doing that with their time? Why are they spending their money like that? Why are they treating their body like that? Why are they um, still in a relationship with this person that's not good for them, that's, not, that's hurting them, that's danger to them? Um, and equally, as you get wiser, what that does is makes you realize how much you don't know. <laughs> and that, that, you know, if you're someone who thinks they're trying to figure everything out, and then you become wise enough to realize you can't figure everything out, and that's, I guess, where Solomon got to. Um, he, he realized, what did he say? He said, there is no end. Um, I, set up, I set out to learn everything from wisdom to madness and folly, but I learned firsthand that pursuing all this is like chasing the wind. Um, and, you know, God himself knows everything. He is, the, you know, wise, the wisest person there ever is. And Jesus was described as a man of sorrows because he knew all about the world. He, knew, he knows all about me and you. And it brings him sorrow. But it says in verse 15, what is wrong cannot be made right. What is missing cannot be recovered. And that means that God can put things right. We can't. And often we can drive ourselves crazy trying to fix our lives. You know, trying to get everything in order. Um, a lot of people suffer with anxiety because they're trying to control things. And, you know, there's the saying, you know, uh, humans, they can try and fix someone. You know, it's often it's said of wives, they try and fix their husbands because <laughs> we're such a mess. And it can be infuriating, can't it? Because it's just not possible to fix um, someone that only God can fix. And, you know, some people are trying to fix the world, aren't they? Like my dad was saying, global warming. There's these people who are trying to fix the world. And it's like, well, you can't put it right because ultimately, if you read Genesis 3, everything's under a curse. What is missing cannot be recovered. However, there is one person who can make all things right, all things new, and that is Jesus. And so, Ecclesiastes, you know, pursuing wisdom. Why do we have universities? Why do we have uh, schools? Because we want our children we want to become wise we want to learn and that is that is right you know a lot of the ch uh, schools were started by the church because it's only right God calls us to rule the earth and subdue it and that means learning he's given us everything in the world to learn and you know when the Bible um, spread and was translated that actually increased literacy uh, you see now that rates of literacy have plummeted in the same kind of way that re rates of biblical literacy have plummeted and when God's word is neglected then we see what effect that has on on education uh, and wisdom and knowledge um, through the generations and so pursuing wisdom yes it's futile if you do it outside of God if you fear God and know he is the source of all wisdom and ultimately your efforts are but a breath compared to the, you know, an, an infinitely wise and infinitely knowledgeable God, then it, it brings you grief. But when you live your life with God as the foundation, then actually you bring God glory. You know, if you're a scientist, for example, and you fear God and you trust God and you um, glorify God, then your work actually brings him glory because you're discovering more about the world he's given us and you're not trying to become God. You're not trying to become so wise that you think you know better than God and people make that mistake. So education is good. You know, increasing in knowledge is good but if we make that the sole goal of our life and try to find meaning and identity and, um, yeah, salvation ultimately in knowledge and wisdom, then it's like chasing the wind. What we really need is the wind of God, yeah. the spirit of God, the breath of God. You know, we are but a breath, but really without the spirit of God, without the breath of God, then we're here today, gone tomorrow, and our life is meaningless. Um, other ways, chapter 2. So this was another way that he, um, the teacher 
tries to find meaning. He says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless or empty or like a vapor. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided, decided to cheer myself with wine. <laughs> I've worked in education as a teacher for a long time, and that's what a lot of them had to do or chose to do by the end of the week. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. Now, that's funny, because I went to university, and when I was there, I saw a lot of this. You know, you're there going to university to become smarter, cleverer people, and yet, what would they do? They'd drink themselves silly, clutching at foolishness. You know, all these re clever people, l you know, discovering new things about the world, and yet at the same time destroying their bodies <laughs> through, through drinking too much, um, or drugs even. Um, and it's like, yeah, that is what people do. They do seek wisdom whilst clutching at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness mo most people find during their brief life in this world. You know, for a lot of people, that is it, isn't it? It's pursuing pleasure for the short time. You know, people say, oh, you only live once, go and do as much, um, seek as much pleasure and thrills and excitement and entertainment as possible because you've only got a short life. And... Um, it says, he also tried, verse 4, also, I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself. You know, that's what people do with money, build a big house. And then it says, and planting beautiful vineyards. So obviously, you know, gardens, get a big house, get a big garden. Um, Solomon says, he, I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs. Not all of us could do this, but I'm sure, you know, if we had Solomon's resources, we might try. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I, be, I built reservoirs to collect the water, to irrigate my many flourishing groves. That was technology. So invested in technology. You know, if you have lots of resources, you might get a big house, fill it with all the latest technology, and hope that that um, uh, gives you, uh, your life meaning. I, um, I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. So, you know, we, we might want to relax and we don't want to do anything so we get technology these days to do the jobs for us so we don't have to do anything uh, in those days it was it was slaves and servants I bought slaves both men and women and others were born into my household I also owned large herds and flocks more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me again wealth in those days was your herds and your flocks um, I collected great sums of silver and gold. If it was Solomon, then we're talking tons and tons of gold. The treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers. You know, you might have gone to the best concerts, had a Spotify subscription, maybe had a record player. Um, I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. So, you know, ex um, pursued pleasure in sex as well. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work. So that's ironic, isn't it? The guy, the guy who has all these resources, gone on about how he's, you know, um, had slaves and both men and women, uh, born into his household. He then, that isn't en enough, so he ends up doing the work himself or working hard. You know, often people do that, don't they? They retire and then realize actually they miss hard work. Uh, and actually, you know, people who win the lottery, sometimes they go back and get a job because actually they miss hard work. It says, a reward for all my labors. Verse 11, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. So I decided to compare wisdom with foolishness and madness. For who can do this better than I, the king? I thought wisdom is better than foolishness, just as light is better than darkness. For the wise can see where they are going, but fools walk in the dark. Yet I saw 
that the wise and the foolish share the same fate. Both will die. So I said to myself, since I will end up the same as the fool, what's the value of all my wisdom? This is all so meaningless. For the wise and the foolish both die. The wise will not be remembered any longer than the fool. In the days to come, both will be forgotten. So I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. <laughs> so that's, you know, he's looked at actually becoming wise or staying a fool. You both end up dead. <laughs> so it's like there must be something. There must be something wrong here, isn't there? There must be something more. And obviously we know by reading the conclusion that actually the most important thing is to fear God. Whether you're the wisest person on earth or you're a fool, fear God. Um, live your life in view of that. Right, then he looks at work. Verse 18. I came to hate all my hard work here on earth, for I must leave to others everything I've earned. That's the reality, isn't it? You can work all your life, and then it's just left to other people who haven't worked at all for it. And who can tell whether my successors will be wise or foolish? Yet they will control everything I've gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. You know, you can work like, I think, was it Bill Gates, who was like, oh, I'm not just going to give all my wealth to my children, so he's giving it away. But, you know, a lot of people will work all their life and then give everything to their children or whoever, you know, their, um, whoever they leave their money to, and they don't know whether that person will just go on a splurge and spend it all in a week. Or, you know, spend it on bad things or just, you know, do the things that they wouldn't have wanted to do with it. So, ultimately saying, you know, don't put all your hope in, in that because you work all your life and then it's left to someone that you have no say over what happens. Yet they will control everything I've gained by my skill and hard work under the sun. How meaningless. So, I gave up in despair. And this is the thing, without God, without hope of, you know, eternal hope that Jesus gives us, where do we turn? Despair. So I gave up in despair, questioning the value of all my hard work in this world. Some people work wisely with knowledge and skill, then must leave the fruit of their efforts to someone who hasn't worked for it. This too is meaningless, a great tragedy. So what do people get in this life for all their hard work and anxiety? Their days of labor are filled with pain and grief. Anyone had a, a painful day of grief when you're at work? Left work thinking, oh my word. E even at night, their minds cannot rest. I've been there in work. Something's happened at work or there's a project that you're working on and, and your, your mind's thinking about it at night time. Um, even at nights, their mind cannot rest. It's all meaningless. So I decided there is nothing better than, better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. This too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. And those last few verses, I think, are really important because it says, who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? And so, actually, in this life, we fear God. God calls us to enjoy life. You know, we, we sh we're not called, well, <laughs> most of us are not called to be monks, you know, to live alone, to abstain from any sort of fun uh, and to, you know, never experience companionship uh, and things like that. We're not called to be monks. We're called to enjoy life. God gave us this world to enjoy it. And as Christians, we should be people who enjoy life more than anyone else. Um, and so he says, I decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. You know, we can be so busy pursuing wisdom, knowledge, work, um, pleasure, 
but we actually forget that actually something, sometimes the most beautiful thing is sitting down with friends, with family, enjoying a meal together, and actually that has come from God. God's given us, you know, in the Garden of Eden, he gave us what fruit to eat, to eat. So that was one of the very first commands, to multiply, to have companionship, to have children, to have a family, to lead our families, to protect our families. Um, ultimately, those are the things that we enjoy. You know, you can have a job and you can work on it all your life, but if you die, you know, they'll replace you tomorrow or within a few days, won't they? But actually, you know, your family can't replace you. And so it's important that we, we do the things that God's given us and we do them well. It, it says, I've decided there is nothing better than to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. You know, work is good. Find satisfaction in it. But don't find your identity in it. You know, do a good job. The Bible says, do everything, um, whether you what is it, eat or drink, do everything to the glory of God, or word and deed. Basically, everything that we do, we should do as if we're serving God. So whether that's work, whether that's studying, we do it to serve God, not ourselves. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the time we get it wrong and we think it's about ourselves. But actually, everything is for God. Um, I decided there was nothing better to enjoy food and drink and to find satisfaction in work. Then I realized that these pleasures are from the hand of God. For who can eat or enjoy anything apart from him? The ability to enjoy food is actually from God. You know, um, I don't know if anyone else had this, but obviously during the whole COVID uh, pandemic, when I got COVID, it was uh, awful because I couldn't taste anything. I couldn't smell anything. And I just felt, oh, how awful is life if you can't taste anything? Because um, God's given us these things to enjoy. God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to those who please him. And then it says, but if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. Ultimately, we will inherit the earth. You know, it says, the, I think it says in the, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. Um, and, you know, there might be people who are wicked, who don't know God, who are actively opposed to God, who may have great wealth. But ultimately, at the end of everything, when God has, you know, when God has judged every man, every woman for their deeds, the wealth that they had, they will be lost. And ultimately, it's, you know, it's those who know God, who live uh, in God's kingdom, who go to heaven, who spend eternity with him, who receive those riches. Um, it says God takes the wealth away and gives it to those who please him. This too is meaningless, like chasing the wind, because there's nothing you can do about that. Um, and so, yeah, Ecclesiastes is a challenging one. And I think, you know, if you, if you read all that without the last verses, then you might say, well, all I need to do is eat and drink and be merry if you're in the world. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And that's not what it's saying. It's saying enjoy life. Don't get so preoccupied with trying to figure everything out, trying to become God, basically trying to be in control of everything, trying to um, extend your life, you know, or at least, you know, have the, the only live once mentality. It's actually, we live for Jesus. We live for Christ. Uh, however long God li gives us on this earth. And so the Bible says to you know, teach us to number our days. And so, I mean, we'll look at companionship and, and things like that, that later, and, and work and wealth. But ultimately, we shouldn't ever get so distracted by the things of this world that are like vapor, that we chase after and we try and grab and hold on to and then they dis disappear. We should actually just enjoy the life that God has given us, the pleasures God, God has given us from the hand of God. You know, when we sit down for lunch this afternoon, the people you sit down with, the food that's on the table is from God, and we should enjoy that. Um, but like I say, we fear God, don't we? We fear God as the end of chapter 12, at the end of Ecclesiastes, it says everything will be judged by God. 
So enjoy life, enjoy food, enjoy drink, enjoy uh, family, enjoy the things that God gives us in this short life. But he is our judge and we need to fear him. So that means that we enjoy those things in the right way. You know, we don't let them control us. We don't try and become God. We don't try and um, achieve something that God doesn't want us to achieve. He wants us to hold on lightly to the things of this world, but hold on tightly to the things of him. And um, I think one of the great things about the book of Ecclesiastes is it encourages us to let go of the things of this world and, and just hold them very lightly, you know, like with an open hand. You know, we, we receive them if God brings them our way, if he gives us, you know, great wisdom, if he gives us knowledge, if he gives us uh, wealth and, and pleasure and, and good things in life, whether he gives us good jobs, we hold on to them lightly. We don't burn ourselves out thinking that that vapor is going to stay around forever, thinking that that vapor can be taken hold of. We enjoy them and we do, um, we live life, but we live life in the fear of God knowing that he will judge everything we do. And so, yeah, that's what I would say. I'd say we don't need to be um, depressed. <laughs> we don't need to be in despair. We don't need to, equally, we don't need to just forget God and think we can do what we like. We can't. It's very, very clear at the end of that that God will judge every single thing, whether people know about it or whether people don't know about it. But if God gives us his pleasures, from his right hand. Um, and so we'll look at the rest of Ecclesiastes in the following coming weeks. Um, it's worth reading. It's very quick to read through the whole 12 chapters. Um, and it does really um, help us with the reality of life. Because that is the reality. Life is short. Um, and we can't take anything with us. Um, so, I'll, yeah, I'll just pray and then we'll f finish. Father, thank you that you never change. Father, we don't know the people who uh, built this building that we're sat in now. Father, we know that our lives won't be remembered in generations to come. Help us to live this life that you've given us, this short, very short life that you've given us. Help us to live it well. Help us not to waste it in seeking things that we think will bring us life, that will bring us meaning. Father, thank you for the good gift of wisdom. Thank you for the good gift of, of knowledge. Thank you for the good gift of food, of drink, of pleasure, of, of gardens, of houses, of homes, of, of technology, Father. Thank you for the gift of work. Thank you for the gift of jobs. Thank you that you've blessed us with these things. But Father, let us hold on to those things really lightly. Let us hold on to you tightly. Let us hold on to your commands. Father, it says in chapter 12, help us to obey you. Help us to fear you. Help us not to fear anything else. Help us not to fear the loss of, of our lives. Help us not to fear the loss of, of wisdom, of knowledge, of, of work the lo loss of pleasure, but help us to fear the loss of you. We want to hold on to you tightly. We want to fear you. We want to obey your commands, and we want to, um, yeah, be found righteous. Thank you for your son. Thank you that even though from our, our point of view, from our human point of view, we can't fix things. Help us not to try and control things that only you can control. Help us not to try and fix things that only you can fix. But thank you for your son who came to make all things new, who came to, um, yeah, give life where there was death. Thank you for that offer of salvation, of that righteousness, that, that righteousness that comes from you that, so that at the end of our lives, when we've lived them for you, Father, that we can be declared righteous, that the that you as our judge would declare us righteous and justified before you. 
Father, help us to seek the wisdom of Ecclesiastes and help us to um, use it to change the way we live, to live lives that are wise, that number our days, that um, seek you, that trust you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.